superficially the, the logic to to deal with these two topics is to start with grow and then control. But actually, I feel for the incumbent banks, um, their appetite for growth will almost be driven by their sense of uh, can they control this? Um, and like, let, let's face it, you know, these APIs will be will be initiating the movement of funds and very sensitive data about, about money. Like, what we ain't sharing selfies here. You know, f f uh, missold financial services ruins lives and destroys businesses. Um, and, and misbehavior inside financial services and misconduct of financial services can have grievous consequences for both investors and customers and staff. Uh, so in, in that context, you know, financial services is heavily regulated and will remain heavily regulated. And one, one way to lose experienced bankers is to give them the sense that they'll be expected to travel as fast as Amazon. And they won't be expected to travel as fast as Amazon. In fact, they won't be welcomed should they try to travel as fast. By their nature, banks tend to be the very last adoptees of new ways of technology. And actually, if you stand back far enough from it, they should be the last, <coughs> considering the payload that they're carrying in terms of what they're doing. So some people would argue that banking isn't different. I argue that it is different, given the consequences of what happens when it's mismanaged. It can blow up economies. They don't just blow themselves up. So in that context, I think control is particularly important. And when talking to clients, and you, you've, you, see, you get the sense that you're losing them in terms of how fast innovation and competition can take place inside an ecosystem, and it doesn't always have to be them. They just have to be loosely coupled to that innovation. I try and bring it back to, listen, you don't have to go as fast as, as very nimble organizations that don't have your responsibilities or your market position. But if you can go twice or three times as fast as your traditional rivals uh, or emerging rivals, it could make a massive difference to your business performance. So, so in that context, uh, banks will go and the financial services environment will move faster. Um, and those who succeed are those who manage to move faster in a controlled way. Okay, so back to the five sections. I'm on to the, the last one. And it, it may seem strange to um, uh, deal with the whole issue of controls under perceptions and mindsets. But actually, they are the most powerful control of all. Uh, so you, you can do templates and check boxes and all sorts of stuff around. I'm, I'm thinking of the, of the commercial direction of an organization and people being accountable and answerable and feeling uh, empowered, but also responsible for various stuff. Um, the most powerful thing is ultimately perception uh, and mindset. What direction are we going? Who's doing what? Who's taking what decisions? And who's accountable for uh, the safe conduct of those decisions. Um, so uh, in terms of coming back to how to grow, um, very much in terms of perceptions and mindsets, uh, can you get the correct controls across your organization? So coming back to the story about, about BBVA, they'd obviously completely bought into the idea of open banking inside their engineering department. And yet, even with the most powerful official sponsorship in the organization from CEO level, once they got out of that environment, it crashed and burned. Okay, so and you're literally burning investment money at that stage if you can't get into the market. So go to market would look very different for banks. A and when you're monolithic, as these organizations have been to deca for decades, and you do everything yourself, so it's your own content, your own channel, your own brand, you might have four big launches a year if you have a good year. Okay? And in that context, moving into an ecosystem environment where there's multiple process innovations, some of which you're initiating, some of which you're only part of. Your customers, the end users, are much happier because they're getting something fresh and new from the ecosystem every day. But uh, in, you could be in a situation where all of a sudden, as a bank, because you're moving from these monolithic channels to Lego pieces, you have four innovations a day or four innovations a week. And in that context, uh, if nothing else, the sheer velocity of the change in distribution method will challenge uh, uh, traditional methods of product oversight and being happy that situations are fair to customers. Um, and you know there are written legal obligations that banks are under in relation to product oversight and uh, mis-selling and conduct and being fair to customers. And uh, there's no provision from the same regulators who've brought you CMA, uh, Open Banking and PSD2 to say, now we understand that you're going to be going so much faster, we're going to tear up the rule book. Okay? On the contrary, uh, the, the same punishments will be handed out as if this, uh, traditional distribution methods were, were being used. So I was funny, I was taken by what Sarah was saying, is that, is that Amazon have uh, thousands of teams. Some of these monolithic organizations that are the, probably the likely first 
uh, banks as a platforms have teams of thousands, okay, to, to exaggerate the difference. And I suppose in that monolith is the challenge. Okay, so I was at something recently and some speaker uh, said uh, that the way things were shaking, shaking me up, that we could have open banking and we could have DevOps, we just need to have a banking lawyer on every one of the DevOps teams. Okay, and everyone laughed and then they realized, oh, maybe he's actually being serious. Okay, so, so, so bear in mind is that the, these, these organizations, which are the likely starting point for banking as a platform uh, and for the platform vocation of banking, uh, have organizational structures um, that uh, are geared towards very, very mature market structures and operating at scale in very predictable market structures. Um, and to get to market uh, with any new innovation, and I, I can see nothing in the regulations that doesn't say that every single new API that can be made available for publication won't be treated as a product, as if it's a new mortgage product. Okay, and you know, so there's no wriggle room here at all in terms of saying, so, so how products are defined under product oversight rules are actually quite broad. Any new product or process, blah, 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 that can have a significant impact on customers. And not only will this thing be happening at a far higher pace, but it'll be happening with the participation of developers, which is also entirely new. Um, so I think there's copies of, of open banking strategy formation there. And I, I spend a lot of time talking around how, how the various functions of the organization are going to be newly challenged by open banking. And one of the key ones here is the, the key chapters around sales and service. Okay. Banks have traditionally sold their own stuff. It's not sold to developers. Um, or it's sold to a very small number of brokers. And th there's, there's some logical cultural reasons for that, in that the main product of banks is actually conditional. It, the, the secret sauce is credit, and they go out to try and sell it, but actually you mightn't be able to have it. Okay, so in that context, uh, most of the most significant fines they might encounter would be from mis-selling from their sales force. Uh, therefore, there's lots of, in, some intuitive and many traditional cultural reasons for banks to want to have the control of their sales force, control of their incentivization, cons con control of discipline, okay, and when it comes to what that sales force are reselling, given that it's highly regulated, like what's that old TV ad for Ron Seal that has to do exactly what it says on the tin, okay? This is not the culture of platform orchestration where you put out Lego pieces and see what your developers do with it, okay, and give them sufficient autonomy. So, there needs, so for a successful transition towards open banking becoming a mainstream distribution method in financial services, there'll have to be organization-wide understanding of the differences between product businesses and platform businesses. And, and it's, not, it's not as if you know, banks are full of bright, motivated people, but it's not a case of these are, these are businesses that are born as platforms. They are born as product businesses and they have to make a, a transition and many people within these organizations might be uh, unconvinced as yet that, they, that, that there will be this, this transition. So um, I suppose in terms of, the, on, on the, on the right-hand side of the slide is, is obviously a very high-tech representation of a, a pretty much standard control framework, okay, for an organization, it doesn't have to be a bank, and the control frameworks typical to most organizations uh, are a combination of basic level accounting, quality assurance control systems. So the general controls and application controls that, that uh, oversee activities on a day-to-day -day basis. The next layer of control is, is uh, more strategic, but it's the internal environment. And it's a combination of management's philosophy, the business models, corporate governance, who makes decisions, who's got what accountabilities, how does risk assessment take place, how do resources get allocated and controlled. And then lastly, in terms of banking, uh, well, external environments, which are also a control uh, on behavior in that there's both regulatory intervention and then commercial pressure. Okay, and I suppose in financial services, given the nature of the, the fuel they're carrying, uh, the external environment is quite intrusive. Okay, so it's intrusive enough around your conduct and your risk management in normal circumstances, but you know, forcing through open banking is, is as intrusive as it gets. Okay, so if, if a bank, if a traditional bank wasn't operating under a license, and they were a conventional limited company, they'd be in the courts now about confiscation of uh, their uh, assets in the context of uh, data under PSD2. And they could win their case 
on the basis of this is an interference with our constitutional right to property. The reason why open banking is happening is that they're operating under license, okay, Reg uh, in, in a regulated environment, doing something very specific. And in that context, open banking, in terms of being forced to make third parties uh, get access to both payments and payments data, is in effect a radical modification of that license. And whether you believe that it's a radical reduction of the value of license, uh, you'd believe that if you thought that it's a zero-sum game and that platform ecosystems don't grow the market, and if you saw it as an enabling, uh, if, if you saw platform ecosystems as a, as a vehicle for growth, you may see the modification of your license as, as an opportunity because, of course, uh, it's not a case of Barclays or HSBC or Lloyds have to open up their data to third parties. Barclays can go and take data from Lloyds and Lloyds can take data from HSBC. Uh, anyone who is a account servicing PSP can take data from each other. Okay. But in terms of what's happening at the moment, the PSD2 project is starting open banking. And uh, I don't envy the people who are tearing their hair out trying to understand regulated technical standards, which are neither standard nor technical, uh, fr from the regulators. Okay. But that's very much around starting open banking. Um, and I suppose the control framework that's at play is the general controls and the application controls at a basic level. And there's s plenty of organizations who are going through the compliance project and who have made, made no strategic decision about their appetite for going beyond PSD2 in relation to using open APIs as a major uh, force for uh, re-engineering and distribution. Okay. So that's, that's the first basic layer. And a lot of the noise is around that at the moment in terms of of uh, basic control of the regulatory mandated, mandated APIs. But in terms of scaling open banking, okay, perhaps the most important element in the control environment and the internal environment is strategic perspective. Okay? And uh, there's actually major cultural differences in, in, in positioning products and actually pursuing coordination uh, through an ecosystem. Uh, and it isn't a case of minor modifications. There, there are absolutely fundamentally different perspectives. Um, and ultimately, I suppose, you can look at strategy in a few different ways. You can look at it as a plan where there's a three-year plan for investment and there's a three-year plan to get into certain market segments or a certain three-year plan to cut costs. Or it can be a pattern of activity, which is, you know, it mightn't be written down so much, but this is how we do things. Um, and, you know, on-the-job training almost and corporate culture drives a process where this is how we go about it and there's informal tacit controls on people which are almost driven by other people frowning at them when they suggest certain ways of doing things differently okay you can see it as a plan or pattern or as, as a position okay I look around at all my existing and emerging competitors and um, and I decide what's scary and I decide what, 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 what I'm going to copy and I decide what I'm going to uh, do myself that no one else has thought of. So that strategy is position. And SWOT analysis and all this type of stuff is based on I'm here at a point of time and I look around at threats and opportunities and strengths and weaknesses and I decide what to do and then I put together a plan of action and I go off and do it and I really hope that no one else moved while I was moving from point A to point B. Okay, so these are strategic planning techniques. But ultimately, open banking if it's going to a, a be adopted aggressively and quickly, is a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective of banks, uh, credit institutions by their nature want to connect their balance sheets to the balance sheets of their customers. They want to take deposits in or capital in from people with too much capital and they want to recycle it out to people who are short of capital. And ultimately, that's what they exist to do. That's their role in the economy. And if they believe they are not connecting to trade, in, a, seem, in a, a fashion that will allow them to grow their balance sheets, um, then you know, they're just not at the races. So in that context, it's a matter of perspective. And perspectives will change because these monolithic, system, these monolithic approaches, you know, many, many people who are employed inside traditional banks to digitally innovate go home at Christmas every year having got nothing to market. Okay, that, that you know, trying to get their own product assembled, compliant and delivered out through their own channels there's a massive queue, and some of them never actually get to the top of the queue. Okay, so in that context, the idea of only having to get as far as a suite of APIs and then allowing the user interface to be managed by third parties at a profit and at a growth speed that's faster, maybe at an intellectual level is penetrating the C-suite of banks. 
And I suppose that I saw a very interesting piece of research recently. One of the big advisory houses asked the C-suite of big banks, did they, what, did they think open banking was important? And it was 80% thought it was very, very important. And then they were asked, did they have confidence in their organizational capability to participate progressively? And they think it dropped to about 8%. So, so they get it intellectually. And now it comes down to, can they actually manage and, and govern? Um, but ultimately, the, the biggest control is, is, is perspective. And I suppose in, in terms of those objectives that get set, um, bear in mind, if we believe open banking is going to happen and at a certain pace, one of the key bottlenecks is, is the banks as providers of the first components to fuel the marketplace. And bear in mind that how they achieve coordination. Uh, so if you just park for the moment that they'd have to change their perspective to go after this aggressively, how do they coordinate? This, you know, it has to do what it says on the tin. It's command and control. The ATMs have to do this because our name is on the front of it. Uh, so do the branches. Uh, so does the corporate banking application. So does the small business uh, banking application. And running an open innovation strategy and orchestrating an ecosystem, the key uh, coordin coordination is achieved through gatekeeping, process control, metrics and relationship management okay because it's an elastic band that you have attached to the developers it's not a, not a it's not a you don't control them and, and in that context bear in mind what psd2 has done in that in that the regulator to try and act as a catalyst for the formation of open innovation in financial services has taken on the role of gatekeeping they're going to decide who's an aisp and a pisp and an aspsp so in terms of platformification of european banking they've taken on this role. Um, in terms of process control, if you read through PSD2, all of the obligations on the ASPSPs acting as platform uh, has to be for, uh, on reporting risks, um, reporting breaches, uh, and there's a whole swathe of metrics being uh, put together now by the FCA as the UK competent authority, where reports will have to be filed on how many PISPs and AISPs are using a particular bank's platform. So and in terms of process controls, there's significant process controls. Uh, if a end user complains that they didn't authorize a payment and they initiated it through a third party um, and uh, the, the underlying account servicing payment service provider, the bank, has to refund them immediately, even if uh, they believe the mistake was made by the third party. So these are pretty significant process controls. Um, that are being put in place. Um, but, but what it's doing is that it's bouncing in the traditional banks into the API economy um, and creating a catalyst which is, well, you better learn to partner guys to make profits because we're going to make you partner for nothing, okay, up to a certain uh, specification. But what it's actually doing is actually, because it's not organic, it's actually constraining the thought process in the banks to some extent. So. I certainly have come across uh, market participants who are going through PSD2 compliance and I'm saying, listen, are you building a billing module so that if you decide to build out some of these services with your own premium APIs, you can charge them, you know, tiered for usage, per API call and stuff like this, and they're not. They're absolutely not. And they're also talking about API strategy and I say, listen, how far have you got in terms of phasing in the ability to ingest data? So, you know, you, 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 another bank decides to take data from you, you want to retaliate. How do you know you can comply with GDPR if you're Barclays and you've taken a load of data from HSBC? If you've only taken it for the purpose intended, you've stored it appropriately, you've controlled it appropriately, and you, you've disposed of it appropriately. Uh, and because PSD2 doesn't mandate any ingestion of data, uh, they haven't made any provision, or they've made little provision. So in the context of that, PSD2 is hugely advancing uh, the process of assembling some equipment uh, and looking at the abstraction there and, and making service oriented architecture a commercial issue for banks for the first time. But actually some of, the, some of the mindset development that would happen if this was organic is being skipped or being missed because of the mandatory nature of, of PSD2 and CMA. Okay. So, so these, these are pretty fundamental things around control um, and uh, so, so don't underestimate how much of a, of a culture shift it is whereby we're going to get ourselves some partners and we're going to tell them what to do. Well, that kind of doesn't work. Okay? Um, and they're not like the, the software industry where 
software players who went into a platform strategy potentially had a long, long time reselling through third parties. Okay, they, they had a distribution channel of third parties and therefore moving from there, so that's a good interim step to move into developers. Uh, there isn't the same history of uh, distributing through third parties directly uh, in financial services. But also uh, in the control environment is, is uh, ultimately, d does a good product design have prospects, uh, no matter how it's positioned in terms of delivery? And you can argue with the platformification of services that a good product outside the right ecosystem is irrelevant, no matter how well priced uh, or how well designed. And ch check your own behavior. When did you last go searching for a website to find something as a starting point? Increasingly, whatever platforms we use day to day, we assume is going to have something that we need. And we don't start with these general searches. Okay. And then in all its glory, architecture to organization, um, we have Conway's law in all its glory, where, where the head of corporate banking wants his or her software same with the head of private banking. Um, and so, so we're moving into a new industry structure potentially where architecture and governance must interlock. Okay, so even leaving aside the pace, the pace of, of innovation that can take place in an open arena, uh, what about the governance of partners? What does that look like? Uh, how, how, how contractually bound do you want to be in terms of lawyers? Uh, or do you want to just go away with implicit contracts based on behavior? because uh, they're two huge uh, speed differentials. I suppose that the next level up uh, we can look at is um, in the internal environment is major practical differences in the structures of business models. Uh, and I alluded to earlier around this client who was very interested in open banking and they had loads of ideas uh, trying to say, listen, it's not your job to have the ideas, but also a, a big increase in the number of partners. Okay? And, and a, apart from there's actually historical reasons why maybe the regulation was necessary because when you have highly concentrated markets and regional markets, certainly in the UK there's maybe five banks that have 80% of the market. So anyone coming to partner okay, um, really has to be scalable okay, because you know, th there really is a reputation being laid on the line in terms of partnering is the first thing. Uh, and secondly, even if a bank does historically, if they historically saw uh, something that looked very, very promising, but they had a 25% share of business banking or 22% share of business banking. I have certain personal experience of this, where you, you're running transactional banking in a market-leading bank, and you see an opportunity to partner and do something innovative that would actually improve your customer experience, and you'd be tempted to do it. And one of the things you'd have to consider is, this guy is easily the best provider in this region. Uh, he's head and shoulders above other potential software companies or services companies that could do something similar. But the minute I announce this publicly, four or five clients of the bank who we lend money to are going to ring their relationship managers and I'm going to get five phone calls going, what are you thinking? Why didn't you use all of us? Why didn't you use me? Uh, do you not know what stake we have in this, in this company? So in the context of this, there's scale issues and cultural issues around the bank's balance sheet that can inhibit. But in terms of the differences of business models, they're, they're absolutely massive. And I suppose the reason why I've done these boring looking tables is that I'm trying, to, trying, to, trying to call out that it's not just you know, the innovation department or the sandbox that a bank has been using to innovate is now going to take on open banking, which is now they're going to talk to developers using the PST2 APIs. The, the, the differences in construct between product businesses and platform businesses are, are line by line different. Absolutely different. Um, so, so the use of partners is, is very rare and, and small. Historically in a closed bank, where in an open bank it's potentially hundreds if not thousands. And I suppose one of the things I've seen on my travels is an assumption that, well, anyone who's going to get access to the ecosystem effects of open banking will have to go through PSD2 accreditation. And I, I don't see it that way at all. Um, I see GDPR as being the enabler of of third-party apps, that if you want to be a platform offering the initiation of payments from bank accounts or extracting data from bank accounts, you need to get a credit under PSD2. There's absolutely nothing to stop you commercially offering API calls to those services into companies that are merely go governed under GDPR. Okay, and w when they sit down, and, like there's a blue, there's a there's a whiteboard in Brussels 
where they are creating a regulated environment. Uh, they're biased towards the bank-to-bank -bank platform because they've integrated a Eurozone bank-to-bank -bank payments platform and they want to see an app economy on top of it. Um, but all of these things are connected. Payments Accounts Directive, Payment Services Directive 2, uh, the ID Directive is on the way, um, uh, interchange caps. So, so all of these things aren't happening at random. Uh, you know, the European project has created the greatest standard settings body in the world and they're setting standards in this space uh, as with, you know, on top of a European social democratic culture. So, uh, but in terms of the internal uh, environment, multi-sidedness is rare uh, in terms of having business strategies where you're trying to match two groups of people and create network effects. Uh, and it's in a platform ecosystem, it's absolutely essential. Okay, so if you're a bank and you want to be the best open bank uh, and you decide that you love uh, students uh, because they're on their way to being the best uh, consumer banking clients, uh, well, now it's a case of I want to open up data and actually potentially look for network effects with software provided by universities uh, and other products and services targeted at, targeted at that life stage. So these type of multi-sided strategies that might be second nature to platform businesses are absolutely new to banks. You know, student, uh, student banking development policies are all hub and spoke, you know, uh, particular services and then turn up on campus and buy them loads of beer. Mm -hmm. How has that changed in my day? Um, so again, key point, it's not, just lit it's not just minor differences, it's fundamentally different to every aspect of the, of the business model. And bearing in mind that we have a transitional period where even the bank that has changed its perspective and is moving towards becoming an open bank is going to be managing both business models side by side. Last bit of the internal environment is, is operating style um, and there's major practical differences um, in terms of, of how this is going to work um, away from business unit command and control and orchestration. Uh, and then from meeting customer needs into that right, the right tension between partner autonomy and process integration. Okay, so can I make this process efficiently integrated that's going to work reliably and uh, keep these developers close to me, but actually do I have enough elasticity in the relationship where the, the, the developer can go and find new micro segments and find new uses for my data and processes in combination with other data and processes. So. And, and don't underestimate how different the innovation mode is going to be. Um, so when you've had banks that for decades have been very deliberate in, in their innovation, uh, to have the idea of emergent innovation with these you know, much smaller teams with autonomy to look after one button uh, or one subservice of the offering, um, it's going to be a major cultural change. So at the moment, if a, a sponsoring executive goes into a bank and says, I'm going to launch a new product, uh, first of all, the committee only sits every two months. Uh, and then secondly, he has to assure the committee that, that this product is fully controlled, that operations know it's there and they're, ready, they're waiting for it. All the distribution channels know it's there. Uh, it's been put into people's objectives. How not to missell it has been put into their training. And they tick all the boxes. You know, the same business executive, if they're now charged with following a change in philosophy and perspective, uh, are now trying to do a box of Lego, are now going in looking for money from the chief financial officer to build a bottle of Lego, and we won't be doing a business case for each piece of Lego. Uh, I want to have a whole box of Lego, I'm going to hand it out to people, and I'm going to try and orchestrate, I'm going to uh, help some of them go uh, take it to further uh, development, uh, I'm going to copy some of them if I think it won't damage the ecosystem, uh, and I just give me the money and give me the latitude. Like, this is countercultural, given where these organizations have come from, particularly given how, how regulated the market is. And then lastly, outside that space, in terms of the external environment, uh, there's the whole issue of market dynamics. Uh, and platform ecosystems can increase market size by reaching new, new micro-segments. And this is what's attractive, particularly to lenders, uh, in terms of reaching new micro-segments, because economies are becoming more specialized and more dynamic and companies are getting, are growing faster uh, and they're achieving scale younger. And all of these developments are, are proving difficult to master in terms of, I want to keep lending and I want to keep growing my balance sheet, 
but there's companies out there that I can't understand because I don't have enough data or it, it's happening too quickly for me and, and, and I can't respond. So to give you a sense of that, in terms of a typical traditional bank, there might be four or five segments. And I alluded to them earlier in terms of private banking, business banking, corporate banking. But if you look at European standard statistics, statistical classifications, so take business banking, uh, you, the European Union and all member states follow this NACE model. It breaks out, for statistical reasons, breaks out businesses into 622 categories. Okay. So yes, they actually collect data on, they separate out the ostrich farmers from the dairy farmers and the, and the, uh, and the tillage farmers. Uh, so, so that level of granularity in terms of economic management and statistical uh, control. But actually, this, this is what this says, is that um, increasingly in the cloud economy, these micro segments will become visible and will become available for credit. Okay, so there's real examples of this. If you go to Google now, and, and ask uh, cloud, subscription-based cloud software for my hairdressing salon, okay? You'll get back five or six solutions, okay? So in terms of this ecosystem that's opening up, okay, there are subscription-based, cloud-based enterprise software solutions that are being created for micro segments that small, okay? So in the future of credit, okay, it will be possible to actually in an API economy, decide I'm going to lend money because I see there's growth. Uh, it appears haircuts are getting shorter. Uh, I'm going to lend money into this sector. Um, and on that basis, I'm now going to ingest data, both from the accounting packages that these hairdressing salons are running, because these all have open APIs. But I'm also going to actually bring in data uh, from their own vertical specific enterprise software to see who's got the most haircuts booked for the next six months. Okay, so in the context of that, this ecosystem is visible and it's being enabled by the modularity of software and the platformification. And banks are starting to have those discussions. But the big question is, well, do we need to invest in a preferred partner that's doing software for hairdressers or, um, but actually the interim steps is actually looking at more granularity inside their own organizations. So instead of having 3,000 small business bankers, now you should have three of them that are looking after hairdressing salon to two parlors and something else. Okay, because actually a, a segment specific data set looks like it's about to emerge. And if nothing else, uh, you're lending to some, some of these people already, but possibly not as much as you'd like. And now you're going to be in a position to peer benchmark them in a way you've never done before. So micro segments is one thing that will attract banks as lenders to open banking. And then the last thing, uh, is regulatory response. Um, and crucial thing to never forget is that nobody regulates the regulators. Okay, so ultimately they go home at the weekend and they can have the challenge for innovation and operational stability unreconciled. It's only the practitioners who have to reconcile the two. Okay, I can tell you from personal experience, I've sat in front of regulators and pointed out two diametrically contradictory pieces of legislation that I was legally obliged to comply with. And they told me that was my problem they were just here to enforce it <laughs> with a straight face. Okay, so, so in the context of that, you know, the same people that brought us open banking through regulation will fine banks for mucking it up. Okay, without a blush. Okay, so, so in that context, oversight needs to evolve in tandem with this. And I suppose one of the things is that there are guidelines out there and best practices pushed at banks around distributors. But the people who've written it inside the regulatory fraternity were assuming that the banks had a handful of distributors, that they were selling to mortgage brokers or they were selling insurance products to, to third parties. And therefore, they've created oversight levels in terms of, are you sure that the third party is marketing into the right market and that the right information is reaching the end customer uh, and that there's a dist distributor feedback loop, uh, which is all very well. It hasn't been written for a scenario whereby a determined open bank has a thousand developers, which is where conceivably this thing could end up. So some of the work I'm doing at the moment is trying to infer from other, other regulations written with other business scenarios in mind, uh, when the regulator eventually gets, gets around to writing guidance notes in three or four years time around best practice for open banks, it'll be on the basis of mistakes that have been made. Okay, so if, if my client wants to scale the fastest, 
they actually have to go off and write what they think the regulator is going to write in three or four years time around best practice uh, and try and infer from other rules and best practices uh, that are designed for product-led distribution of how these should apply with platform orchestration because this is going to be the key to scaling because if markets are regional and there's four or five banks that have 80 percent between them once you have more than 15 percent of the market the developers are going to show up at your doorstep even if your data is terrible so you know if you to rank the five big uk banks you know developers aren't going to blacklist the fifth worst in terms of data quality they're going to use them anyway and put pressure on them to improve therefore the winner is not the one who who best tidies up their architecture because they will all attract developers as a starting point the one who will do best is the one who masters the governance and aligns it with the development of the technical architecture so so the scaling of open banking is a combination of a technology architecture channel uh, challenge and then adopting best practices like devops with the right assistance but then also making sure that the whole governance model that has been geared towards a very very established and mature product led distribution is actually re-educated and uh, positioned to actually enable a far faster tempo of innovation and partnering yeah will be and there'll be there'll be multiple tensions there'll be tensions obviously between partners who are leveraging off this new infrastructure with banks on a commercial basis because it's a new discipline for banks effectively um, and they are product organizations that are used to command and control with that tension and then there'll be tension between the 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 people who are given personal objectives to grow the bank as a platform and people whose personal objectives are to push out own brand products through own channels so so in the context of that uh, there are multiple forces here that will have to be reconciled um, and that's why I come back to the punch in the mouth mm -hmm. that, that people won't intellectually think their way into this it'll be you know ultimately some will go faster and put pressure on others given that this is the biggest change in hundreds of years mm -hmm. banks being forced to allow you to share your data if that's what you want to do with a regulated entity um, I, I look back to the dot-com boom of the late 90s and we all lost money in shares because we believed that the high street was going to be revolutionized in three years and we were all wrong mm -hmm. But actually the high street was beyond stuff we could imagine happened in seven or eight years mm -hmm. and i think this is the exact same thing because websites effectively were the introduction of uh, i suppose human to machine interfaces into what were ma ma mainly human to human services and now this is the introduction of machine to machine interfaces so i think it has the same uh, we're, we're having this intellectual discussion about it now and imagining business models that could be but I think this is in five to seven years, that's the type of time frame, but, but the change will be phenomenal.